And then, for example, in Zamukya, in the Zamukya uh, Empire, there's an inscription which says, Mahamandaleshwar Virupanasara is like a raging fire, raging forest fire for Buddhist and Jain. Which means evidently he persecuted Buddhist and Jains. So they were persecuted by Hindus, unfortunately. You know? And this, you Hindus, if you are, whoever are Hindus here, should know so that it will not happen again. You know? This should not happen. <coughs> Buddhism is part of the Indian subcontinent. It is an integral heritage of the Indian subcontinent. It is as much a part of the Indian subcontinent as Hinduism is as Jainism is, you know, but it was heavily persecuted and weakened, it completely weakened and by the 13th century the final blow to Buddhism was given by Islamic invasion. It was already weakened, the kings, there were very few, few kings to protect them, they were Hindu kings, when the Islamic invasion happened Especially Bhaktiyar Khilji of Afghanistan, which had already, already become Islam, entered into the Ganjanic plain. There were two things that happened, unfortunately for Buddhism. He killed, he and other Muslims killed millions of Hindus also. But the blow was stronger on Buddhism because of two reasons. One is that they thought the Biharas were army camps and they were the same dress were army people. The second was, when he came near Nalanda, he became very sick and his Hakim could not cure him. So some monks from Nalanda came out and told him, we can cure him. But he, you know, how orthodox Muslims would be, they were like kafirs, you know, we don't want anything from them. So they told them, told him, you don't have to leave your religion, you just read your own Quran, but give us your Quran, you know, and then he agreed. So they put mention limb, you know, film in each page, leaf of the Quran. Then they instructed him, when you read the Quran, every page you read, you read it. So that's what he did, and he got cured. But unfortunately, and it seems to be, I don't know, uh, they, uh, for that period also some kind of Islamic thinking style, instead of being happy, he thought these guys are very powerful. They are better than the Hakims, you know, and we can't have them around. Otherwise, we can't take them over. So he attacked Nalanda. Monks ran away. Whoever they could kill, they killed. Men. Sakya Siddhi Bhadra, Kashmiri Brahmin, was the dean, the Upadhyaya. He fled, and from far away, he watched. And uh, they st started burning things and so on. And he wept and said, now Buddha Dharma is finished from Bharat Parsha. Then he came to Nepal, stayed in Nepal, then went to Tibet. And in Tibet, you might have heard of the word Karmapa. He was the one that gave the title of Karmapa to the first Karmapa. Mm -hmm. Sakyasi Bhadra gave him, gave him the title, Karmapa. He passed away in Tibet. He gave the title Pandit, Sakya Pandit. Now, now is all Brahmins call themselves Pandit, but in ancient time, to be Pandit, you have to have the ten vidyas and all those kind of things, master all those. So the Guru, one of the Gurus of Sakya, uh, knew Sanskrit and had mastered all the ten vidyas, music and uh, poetics, all these things. So he gave him the title Pandit, Sakya Pandit. He was a brilliant Tibetan, and it is said that he debated with. Nine pundits from <coughs> India and one from Nepal, Buddhist pundits. He debated with them and he defeated them in debate. And this is the only record, record in the entire history of the Indian subcontinent where a non Indian subcontinent personality defeated an Indian guru or Indian gurus in debate. And when he, he spoke in Sanskrit, he debated with them in Sanskrit. But of course, his uh, um, tone was not correct. It was a bit upside down. And the Indian gurus laughed at when, when he spoke. But however, he defeated them in the debate. And uh, as for Nalanda, 
They took out all the books in the library and there is 90 lakh book you know, since 3rd century, 4th century, 6th century, 7th century, right through 13th century. 90 lakh books and if you burn a pile of books, it turns red and kills his diary says it took 6 months for the redness to settle down and 9 months for the smoke to settle down. He did the same thing with Odantapuri, Saumapuri, Vikramasinghe, Jagadantra, all the northern. These are records, fortunately, remaining in Tibetan uh, records as well. South <coughs> India, we don't even have the names of the Biharas anymore. Oh, what were the Biharas, where were they, and so on, we don't have it. Uh, because Hindus probably destroyed it already a long time before Bakhtiar Hilsi came in. And so, all this were wiped out. <coughs> there is also a recent research I heard, I haven't read it myself, so I just heard it, that actually they just burned the books and killed the monks and left Narada alone and Hindus came in later and destroyed them, so brick by brick, dismantled it too, that's what they say. I don't know how true that is, but it's supposed to be recent research. And so, Buddhism is not a faith-based dharma. You don't can't have Hare Buddha, Hare Buddha type of thing in Buddhism. You need Prajna, understand, and to understand what you're doing, to understand why you're doing it, if, what happens if you do this or that, and so on. That, that requires gurus who know it. Since all the gurus have gone, it was bound to collapse. It was bound to collapse, and so it gradually came down. But as I said, it rained in the Indian subcontinent for almost 60 to 1700 years. And that was the golden age of the Indian subcontinent. Nowadays, Hindu claim a lot of things that the Buddhist did actually. I'll give you an example of golden age. Thayan, 4th century Chinese guru that came to study in Nalanda. He came into the Indian subcontinent, the first town in the Indian subcontinent. Evidently, it was a big town, but it was completely empty. <coughs> but it was speak and span. It was not a ghost town. And he kept on walking, walking, and it took him the whole day. So, must have been a big one, big town or city. And at the other end, all the people were in the, in the field. When they saw him, they invited him back, as it, it is common in the Indian subcontinent, anywhere in the Indian subcontinent, Aditi Deva Baba. So they brought him in. And as he walked in with the Indians, he asked one Indian, I noticed that when I passed by this town, all the windows are open, all the doors are open, there were no locks anywhere, and won't people steal? And the Indian gave a very beautiful answer. Stealing? What's that? So you can imagine that, you know, what is stealing? He didn't even know what stealing was. That was the Prabha, the influence of Buddhism you know, through the centuries. And Nalanda, you had Aryabhat. Now there's a lot of Hindus claim Aryabhat is a Brahmin because he's a Brahmin. He was a Brahmin, but he was a in Nalanda, the teacher of Nalanda, you know, and he was a Buddhist. I know this in one YouTube, he has this, all this Tripunda and so on as Aryabhat, you know. But he was a Buddhist teacher in Nalanda. And he was the one that conceived of the mathemat mathematical zero first. You know? It's very interesting. Nobody knows this. You know? The Indians don't know this. We think it came from the Europe or America, you know, England. In fact, the famous mathematician Bertrand Russell, one day he was asked by an Indian reporter uh, to, for an interview in the UK. And when the reporter went to his door and rang the bell, then Bertrand Russell opened the door and he said, You Indians have invent, given nothing to the world. Then the Indian journalist said, But, 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 and he started laughing and said, By nothing I mean zero. <laughs> and this, without zero, there will be no mathematics. <laughs> Without mathematics, there will be no science. Right? <coughs> and Aryabhata was the first person to conceive of the mathematical zero. 
in Nalanda, in Vikramasi, in Odantapuri, there were astronomical observatories. In six, uh, 680 or 480 astronomical observatories. All these are lost. <coughs> it is found only in travelogues of Vinsan and all this that what was there in Nalanda. But we see today as now the remains of Nalanda is just a small part of it. That is not the whole of Nalanda. Because of, after the Islamic invasion, the final blow was given and Buddhism began to collapse. But because <coughs> it had reigned for 1600-1700 years, it took 500 years to vanish completely. It still took. It still continued to remain interacting and gradually there were no teachers to explain. So the, the old Brahmins were Buddhist and others slowly became Hinduized. The same thing happened in Nepal to especially Nepali speaking people. Inscriptions show that they were originally Buddhists. But there were no more teachers to explain them in their language. There was Tibet, but Tibetan language is foreign. You know? And they don't, they don't understand Tibet that easily unless we learn it. We don't, it's a totally different language. You know? Nepali is an Indic language like Marathi, Bengali and so on with 25% Tibetan Burman vocabulary. So that's why we understand Indians when they speak. We may not speak back properly, <laughs> grammatically totally wrong and so on, but we understand Indians when they speak. But I find <coughs> Indians don't understand us when we speak because we have 25% Tibetan Burman words, words. So that is how the Buddhism finally vanished from the Indian subcontinent. However, that's not fully true. During the British time, I forget if it is, is it Orissa or Andhra Pradesh, there is a school called Mahim Sampradaya. When the British were taking statistics, they claimed that they were Buddhists. And the British asked them that until now you call yourself Hindus. Now why you want to call yourself Buddhist now? And they said, now you are ruling, we are protected. Otherwise before, if we had not pretended to be Hindus, we would have been prosecuted. So again, another record here, you know, a persecution. And so they remain, managed to remain because they call themselves Hindus. But because they call themselves Hindus and pretended to be Hindus, and through the centuries, things got mixed up. Now, I read their literature, it's not pure Buddhism. No, it's a bit mixed up. But this one story where it shows that they were persecuted. This is, I'm so new to you Indians. And today, Hinduism has become a very tolerant religion, and Hindus are very open minded and tolerant. But that period, they were persecutions that happened especially to, for Buddhism. Also, Jains, because this Chalukya inscription says, uh, like a raging forest fire to Buddhist and Jains. And Jains. So that is how Buddhism, the, all the books were burnt, everything was burnt. Fortunately, Sanskrit books existed in Nepal, Kathmandu. But even there, Hindu pressure problems happened. In the 13th century, Jayasthiti Malla forced all the monks to marry and created a caste system according to Manuspriti within the Buddhist group. And he was the king, so they just had to follow it. They could revolt, they were a minority there. So after 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 years, it has become cultural for them. And my own great, 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 six generation ago, grand uncle, when he ruled the kingdom, ordered that all the sutras and tantras in the Bihar is brought up and burnt. Fortunately, at that time, we had a British resident called Brian Hudson. Those days, they were not called ambassadors. The British resident Brian Hudson, he heard this and he went to Jangabad, that was his name, and said, If you don't want them, please give it to me. So I said, Okay, you take it. And so it was taken to London. But in spite of that, the archive in Kathmandu Valley has a vast number of Tibetan and Sanskrit literature, very vast number still existing. 
the tantras, sutras, all various things existing. So this is what happened in the Indian. So in Nepal also it fizzled out, in India also it fizzled out. All the, the Nepali speaking people called the Khas Aryans. You know? The Khas Aryans and the, you guys, the Indo Aryans, are a little bit different. You know, the Indo Aryans entered the Gangetic Plain 1000 years before the Khas Aryans came up above the Pamir Nord into the Tibetan Plateau, down into Nepal. You know, from Nepal they spread east and west. You know, the west is us, uh, east is us, and west is Himals up to Himalchal Pradesh. The Kumau, Garwa, Himalchal Pradesh, the same group. And uh, uh, Nepali language is a kind of continuity of that. Continuity of that. And uh, uh, the same thing happened there. There were no more teachers to explain them in their language. We find, like, even up till 1830, there's a Bihar called Kakre Bihar in a place called Surkhet in Nepal. It doubled in the big earthquake of the 1830. See, unfortunately, your land is kind of pushing into my land. <laughs> and so every 60 to 100 years, we have this 8 Richter, 9 Richter, you know, uh, earthquakes going on. And so this Bihar doubled. The government is renovating it. But there is a monastery in Tibet called Potkhan Monastery where they find a text of Abhisamaya Lankar in Tibetan which says this was translated from the original Sanskrit of Kakre Bihar. So since we don't understand Tibetan too well, most of the Nepalese, so again it began to collapse. But Tibet, there are plenty of Tibetan Bhavan speaking people in Nepal. They continued in Nepal. They put, it trickled down from Tibet and it continued in Nepal. Because Nepal is a very weird concoction. It's small, it's not even as big as some of the states in your, in your country. But there are more than a hundred languages, not dialects, languages within that small area. Some of them seem to lang linguistically seems to have come from Vietnam, uh, Vietnam, uh, some of them from Tibet, some of them Chinese, you know. I, I took my DNA test when I was in America and I was surprised. I had 75%, 75, approximately 74% South Asian blood, 25% Far Eastern and Tibetan blood. You know, <coughs> Tibetan blood. And most Nepalese are like that. So this is the how Buddhism vanished from the Indian subcontinent, you know, in which unfortunately Hinduism did play quite a big role you know, in the earlier periods. And then after that, many, many, many Swamis and Gurus just started creating their own stories about the Buddha and Buddhism. One big example is Rasnish, just creating his own interpretation of Buddhism as if Buddhism had died. But Buddhism did not die. It died in the Indian subcontinent. It continued in China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, uh, Thai, um, Burma, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. It continued. It's still living. Then there's a, I don't remember, the, 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 there's a beautiful poem by Iqbal about the Buddha. I remember only the last one of my book because my Urdu is not too good. But the last word is Shamae Gautam Zadraye Mefile Agia Ariyarame. You know, means in, in country, foreign countries it is still running, it is still bright. So, and that's true. So, however, I think you Indians must understand that Buddhism is an integral part of your heritage. Indians took it all over the world. You know, they sweated out walking those distances to China and so on and giving teachings and helping translate it and so on. The same thing in Tibet. Tibet came down in hordes. It is said that <coughs> because Tibet is a very cold country and those days nowhere, there were nowhere coolers and heaters and those kind of stuff, you know. They would usually come down to Kathmandu for five years to acclimatize and study with the gurus of Kathmandu. Then they would go down to Nalanda, uh, 
machine and so on. But in spite of that, thousands of Tibetans died of the heat of India. And so they made great effort to take the Dharma up there. It was not easy. First of all, if you've been to Nepal, and if you've been trekking, you will understand that crossing from Tibet into Nepal is a league by itself, <laughs> especially in those days when there was there were no planes or anything like that and the roads were not good, they were not roads, you have to walk trek small lanes only, you know. And sometimes you could just fall off down thousands of feet. You know, thousands of feet. So thousands and thousands of the Tibetans died. They brought them back there. Many Indian schools went up, like Adisha Dibankar, he stayed in Kathmandu for a while, then went up to Tibet. And he passed away, as I just said, there, and the, his things were saved because of the Communist Party at Bengal. And Sakya Sirivan, then there were others like Uncle Gayadhar, and who went up to Tibet, and many Indian the Tibetans came down. <coughs> Excuse me. They came down and studied with Indian gurus in Nalanda, Vikramashil, and so on. So, this is how uh, it was transferred to Tibet. Then, in Tibet, they created a lexicon, lexicon called Yudpati in Sanskrit, means a kind of dictionary for every single Sanskrit Indic, Indic word, technical word, Buddhism, a Tibetan word. They created that. And then the king decreed that anybody that translates has to use this lexicon. You cannot translate outside and make your own words. So there is a consistency. And the Tibetan, the same thing in China, they did a lot of effort, but not, they did not really make a lexicon like this. The Tibetan uh, texts are very accurate. <coughs> On the cover page, it's always written, Gyagar Kedu. Gyagar means Indian subcontinent. Kedu means language. Langa Avatar Sutra. Where Kedu? Where is Bhot? You know, Bhot from where the Indians call Bhutia. You know? So Bhot, then where? where? Tibetan, Kedu. Language, Langa Meshi, Do. So every translated text has this, which we, we know that it was translated from Indian languages into Tibetan. And the accuracy was because of the lexicon. And sometimes in some places they even maintained the chanda of Sanskrit, <coughs> which is extremely difficult. So this is how unfortunately Buddhism vanished from the Indian subcontinent.